So um, thanks everyone for coming today to um, this session. I'm Christina Rauenwelder uh, and just gonna go through the agenda on behalf of all the uh, COPTIS organizers who are gathered here, um, including Kirsten Leonard, Shelley Stahl, Leslie Wyborn, Ellen Glaze and Danny Kincaid, um, the latter two who couldn't make it. Um, so we're going to be first hearing from Kirsten an introduction, a welcome and uh, an overview of COPTIS's work in the past. Uh, we'll then be recapping the outcomes of a meeting that we held uh, with the COPTIS organizers and a number of folks at AGU 23 in San Francisco, uh, where we asked attendees to suggest potential topics for COPTIS to address moving forward. Uh, we'll also have a hands-on poll where you'll have the opportunity to give your own opinion on those topics. Uh, then we'll hear from Natalie Rea, who's joined us as the co-chair of the RDA Working Group uh, Coordinating Earth, Space, and Environmental Science Data Preservation and Scholarly Publication Processes, and have an open discussion on what the priorities for COPTIS are moving forward. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Kirsten now to get us started. Thank you. Okay, great. And I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Um, is it visible? Yep. All good. Okay. So now I just have to find my way to uh, get going. So first of all, welcome from me as well. Um, so the goals um, today is learn a little bit about uh, what COPTIS has been up to, what its goals and activities are. And then as Christina said, we have um, a presentation that will show us these topics that have been suggested at AGU uh, just um, not even a month ago and oh, a month ago. All right. And then want you to contribute to setting priorities to um, what COPTIS will be doing. Um, again, um, I mean, you're probably all experts now in the ESIP sessions. Please add your name to the list of attendees in the in the session document. Uh, and um, remember the code of conduct for these sessions. And I wanted to encourage everybody to ask questions and provide ideas and comments because uh, that's how we want to operate and your input is critical. And so my first uh, overview is sort of uh, a bit of history of uh, Coptis for those who may not be familiar with it, and an overview of its activities, uh, its structure, and an outlook um, where Coptis is heading. So, wanted to emphasize that actually um, we are exactly at the 10 year anniversary of Coptis. It started in 2014. Um, with an initial just a little supplement to an existing grant to run a workshop um, that happened in 2014 that was initiated by Brooks Hansen from AGU and myself. Uh, so it's a really good time, I think, to think about the future of Coptis again. The rationale for getting this going in 2014, which is largely still valid today is that scholarly publications are an entry point in making data available, still are for researchers a key high value entry point. And there's still, I mean, this has been uh, improving uh, quite a bit since 2014, but there's still a lot of data that are submitted along with publications that make reuse really difficult or impossible because of uh, the formats and forms of storage that they come in. Uh, on the other hand, we have an increasing number of domain repositories that provide quality and standards and thus are able to really make data fair uh, and allow the reuse in, in science facilitating new discovery discoveries with with these data. Um, and the connection therefore between publishers and domain repositories is essential to bring about best practices, implement these and and develop these. Whoops. 
No, it does not want to move forward. Okay. So the objective uh, that we defined for COPTIS was to really facilitate and foster communication and exchange between editors and publishers of earth science journals or journals that publish earth science uh, papers and earth science data facilities. And the, the goal is to build consensus and consistency uh, among publishers, editors, all these journals, also funders and the data repositories, how to deal with data that are part of scholarly publications. This will help data repositories to collect the data that uh, is within their scope uh, and be more comprehensive, help investigators in uh, more streamlined ways based on that consensus on consistency. And Overall, you know, having this exchange, this communication will help journals, uh, funding agencies, the research community and the repositories to really drive these uh, practices forward and, and implement it. So we had over the last 10 years quite a bit of activities going on that were started. Uh, with two workshops in 2014 and 15, funded by NSF and the Sloan Foundation at the time, uh, through which COPTIS was actually founded. Uh, they advanced international participation, specifically the workshop that we held in the UK. Uh, and they uh, led to a first statement of commitment um, that was expressing the um, the common goals and the commitment to making uh, implementations happen. Um, we have over these 10 years held quite a number of meetings regularly at major conferences, specifically at the AGU meeting and the EGU general assemblies um, that just were really that information exchange, have identified topics and priorities within the community and grew participation in, in COPTIS. Um, further, in 2016, COPTIS led to the Enabling Fair Data Project that really advanced the implementation of recommended practices and policies. And at the end of that project, um, participants in the effort uh, decided that in order to improve sustainability of the COPTIS efforts, it should move into ESIP. And that has given us ongoing support for our activities since then. Um, okay, that was a duplication of slides, but that's fine. Um, so what has come out as products and results, uh, we have had two widely endorsed statements that expressed community commitments uh, to uh, improving the practices and um, procedures of the, that pertain to data and publications. Um, we established a COPTIS website um, that has had or has gathered a lot of information, but you know, and I will come to the limitations of COPTIS as well, hasn't been updated for quite a bit. It initially uh, also con showed a directory of repositories that was specifically built in collaboration with the Center for Open Science, was released in 2015-16, but has been deprecated in the end because of our uh, RE3 data uh, providing a similar service. Uh, journal and author guidelines have been developed and made available on the website based on the enabling fair data recommendations. There have been multiple journal articles and editorials about the efforts that um, and the, the outcomes of COPTIS. Uh, there has been an editor workshop webinar series in 2021 and we will hear a little more later about this RDA working group on coordinating earth space and environmental science data preservation and scholarly publication processes that has also been triggered uh, by COPTIS discussions. The impact really has been that the journals have 
uh, adjusted their policies. Uh, and these are just two examples. There have been quite a number more. And this in turn has impacted the number of data submissions that have gone to data repositories. And you can see here, this is obviously an example uh, that I pulled from uh, my own uh, rep the repository that I'm operating, the EarthChem Library, where a clear jump in submissions is seen in 2019 when the FAIR, um, when the recommendations of the Enabling FAIR Data Projects were implemented. Since about 2020, Hopdis topics have really focused on all the pain points uh, that we discovered in implementing the FAIR Data Guidelines uh, and recommendations that have been identified at all these Coptis meetings and ESIP sessions. Um, and these pertain to, in the first place, really integrating, synchronizing the workflows at the repositories uh, in acquiring data, um, registering data with DOIs and so on, uh, synchronizing that with the manuscript management at the journals and the editorial procedures. Uh, there are still a lot of open questions and what actually needs to be deposited, how raw do the data need to be. We've recently discovered that there is not much uh, available on the inclusion of imagery as data in the guidelines and so on. Um, we are still um, trying to reach more of the editors rather than just publishers that and and help editors really understand the procedures feed have a closer communication with the repositories and so on data citation remain remains a topic uh, and another concern of editors is really what are the recommendations for repositories uh, what are the relevant directories of repositories? There are uh, there's advocacy for domain repositories, but also advocacy for the more generalist repositories. And I should emphasize that really Coptis um, Coptis initial initial goals really focused on the domain repositories as the best places to curate data. So. Uh, that has all been still in discussion. And um, basically, the the time we've had at the meetings at AGU or EGU has not been sufficient to really make a lot of progress on these. And other groups have been taking these things on. So there is, I think, a discussion also necessary in how Coptis leverages what others are doing. Uh, one of the topics has also been how Coptis can facilitate the interaction of repositories with publishers on the domain specific level that is specifically relevant to creating standards and implementing standards for the interoperability and reusability aspects of the FAIR principles. Um, just to emphasize this a little further is that, you know, there's a lot of benefit in the interaction of editors and repositories at the domain or community, specific community level, because there is a clear understanding, better knowledge of domain specific culture and practices, a focus on community specific or domain specific data needs and resources and a more targeted discussion of repositories with editors that is relevant to have that trust uh, develop for uh, editors to really work with the repositories in a, um, in a meaningful way. And, and it comes down to the statement that the devil is in the detail when things get implemented. Whoops. Um, but there are for Coptis over uh, the time we've uh, realized there are some pain points for ourselves. 
uh, there's a lack of resources to support our ongoing activities. And that is clearly uh, true for many of the volunteer organizations. It's people's time that has to go in. Uh, we're limited in our ability to hold events at conferences beyond AGU and EGU, the two societies that have really supported us and allowed PUPTIS uh, to hold meetings without major costs. Uh, the, the presence here at ESIP as a collaboration area in ESIP is that when we hold our sessions in conjunction with ESIP, um, with ESIP winter and summer meetings, uh, we don't get the publishers and editors to attend. And so we need to think you know, about other ways to, to work with publishers and editors beyond our regular uh, sessions at these ESIP meetings. Uh, we're still not very diverse uh, and reaching into the global south in our activities. And we don't have a governance. Uh, that was a very um, intentional decision in 2014. And we need to see if we need to change that or if we can operate uh, without a specific charter or governance. Um, I, I don't need that. That was actually going backward. And I think I'm actually through. Oh, just wanted to emphasize how Coptis actually operates. It is an informal and volunteer-driven initiative. Um, as I mentioned, that was intentional. Uh, it is now an ESIP collaboration area, uh, and meetings have been somewhat irregular, mostly related to organizing sessions and to organizing the meetings at AGU and EGU. Uh, the support from ESIP and AGU has been critical to keep us going. Uh, but I think that the current structure is not optimal and we need to find ways to improve. Uh, we need more active participation by the publishers and editors. We need to you know, identify ways to um, find funding and also um, kind of reach out to get more volunteer effort and more distributed activities. Um, so with that, I'm, I'll stop my sharing and we move further in the agenda. Christina, I'm handing back to you. Thanks, Kirsten. Let me see if I can present correctly this time. Can everyone see my screen and does it look like slides this time? Yeah, it looks good. Wonderful. Um, thanks so much for giving that overview, Kirsten. I am going to talk a little bit about something that we uh, did at AGU 23 at, at the meeting. And I want to emphasize uh, that this was an exercise not designed to answer all of the great questions that Kirsten has brought up. Uh, but Kirsten, Leslie, Helen, Danny, and Shelley had the idea when we held this discussion informally in person at AGU to collect some feedback from uh, the people who made time for the meeting about what they felt were still outstanding issues uh, in the earth space and environmental sciences that might be a good fit for COPDES. And alongside that, we got um, a variety of other things as well, like organizational suggestions for COPDES, next actions and things like that. Um, so we've made a rough stab at organizing those responses and I'll now share uh, the results with you. Uh, and after this, uh, Shelley will lead us through an exercise where you two can give feedback, uh, kind of ranking these responses and issues and giving information about what you think might be something that COPDES should work on next. Uh, so you can see the full attendee responses that I'll summarize in this presentation by following this link. Uh, it's also linked in the session notes. And again, you'll have a chance to give feedback later in the session. You might already have seen a survey that we sent out to the COPDES listserv as well. Um, so uh, at this AGU 23 meeting, we had uh, about 30 or 40 people in the room. Uh, approximately 14 of whom were informatics and data repository people. Uh, we had a variety of publishers and um, they represented both AGU Publishing, uh, Nature, Copernicus, and Taylor and Francis. Uh, so a lot of the publishers who are involved in publishing work from the earth, space, and environmental sciences uh, did have a chance to sort of, you know, put in a post-it note on the board. Um, and we had a couple of funders uh, represented uh, from NSF and from Belmont Forum and others. 
the topics roughly fell into a few different categories. Uh, these were directly uh, categorized from the post-it notes that the attendees put on the board. Um, so about 26 of the post-it notes referred to issues that roughly fall into publisher repository and editor coordination issues, as Kirsten emphasized in her talk. Um, we had a few uh, post-it notes talking about issues of data citation, a few post-it notes talking about repository and infrastructure related ideas, some organizational suggestions for COPTAS, and some others. Uh, the others kind of talked about care principles, about open science, about um, researcher concerns, about sharing their science, that kind of thing. And I'll go into more detail when we get to that slide. So to give you an idea of the kinds of things that people were concerned about at this meeting that we held, uh, I'll talk first about that big category, publisher, editor, and repository coordination. A few big things emerged. Uh, repositories need timing of journal and reviewer needs. That publisher repository editor coordination highlighted in that comment right there directly. Um, we need communications improvement between journal editors and publishers and repositories. Journals and editors need a list of compliant repositories. I've put this early on in the publication process of data and articles because uh, we all know if you want to publish in a discipline specific repository that offers curation, you need to start that process early on, not as you receive paper reviews and uh, suddenly find out that you need to publish your data alongside your paper. Uh, we also need to support the training of editors and see how we can connect editors to repositories. Uh, to educate authors on DOIs for data, embedding DOIs in paper, so again, kind of overlapping with data citation issues, and on the timing and workflow of how they get their data published, as well as how they get their article published with that data alongside. From the publishers in the room um, and from the editors in the room, we heard a few other concerns, uh, that editors are overwhelmed by workflows and processes, uh, and that they're still lacking author guidance on domain repositories at journal submission. And specifically about the peer review system, that if we're going to review data sets, we need reviewers who can handle review of data sets. So whether they're data experts or whether we offer further reviewer training. A lot of publishers in the room were also concerned that putting more of a burden on uh, peer reviewers during the peer review process just straight up would not work. Uh, the data citation issues, uh, there were a lot fewer comments here, so we have a bigger proportion of them on screen. They all revolved around credit and incentives for the most part. Um, how do we value the DOI, uh, as well as how do we find out what sites that DOI, tying back into credit, uh, which can be an incentive in and of itself. Uh, repositories should have an avenue to retroactively help get DOIs into journal citation where missing. I want to highlight this post-it note in particular uh, because this is an uh, this is something that uh, is a big infrastructure hurdle and I think emphasizes uh, that we're now figuring out after we publish data, after we publish articles, how important uh, linking of DOIs to those articles is. And there's no real workflow for this to be done after the article has been published and gone through peer review. Um, repository and infrastructure issues will be very familiar to a lot of the people in this room. Uh, of course, there's the usual concerns about sustainability uh, for repositories and sustainability for data curation, which takes time and effort. Um, there's also a concern about communicating with data users. They need to begin working with a repository before they submit the manuscript. There's also a few other interesting questions here, um, like how can repositories or funders work together to assign and direct projects to repository at the time of funding? And then finally, some of those other topics that came up uh, that didn't quite fit into any of these other um, categories. Uh, care principles, indigenous and local people's knowledge was a category. Uh, that's all the information we have about the suggestion, but it was mentioned by two people. Um, some people mentioned that uh, we need capacity building for both scientists and reviewers. Um, concerns about open science requirements for ECRs, uh, scooping concerns, and needing a better value proposition for research data practices. Um, if any of you attended the session that Natalie and I hosted earlier today uh, on lowering barriers uh, to analytical lab data for researchers, uh, this is something that came up during that session as well. How do we incentivize researchers to do good, fair data management uh, when there really isn't a good incentive structure for them right now? Uh, there are also a few organizational suggestions for COPTIS that came up that I'll highlight here. As Kirsten mentioned, important to co-locate future COPTIS meetings at regular publisher and editor meetings. There's also a suggestion that repositories or World Data System uh, could go to the editors at uh, SSP meetings, uh, go to the editors and the publishers, that is, and offer training workshops for them on how to integrate with repositories. There's also a suggestion that um, might develop pilots to implement production guidance 
with willing publishers and domain-specific repositories. And I'll mention here that um, AGU, many of you probably will know, has had a pilot going for some uh, time now uh, that implements production guidance on beta citation with our authors, so helping them share their data and share their software. Uh, we don't recommend repositories, but we have found that providing staff guidance and support for researchers has resulted in a big uptake of linking to data, linking to software, and sharing that data and software. A lot of these uh, organizational suggestions also uh, are helpful in thinking about how we can coordinate between publishers, editors, and repositories. So I hope that's uh, given you something to think about as we move into the Mentimeter poll. I'm gonna hand it over to Shelly now. I'll navigate the slides for the Mentimeter. Uh, and what we'll do is you'll uh, be able to pull up either the link from the chat or using the QR code on the screen and go through as we are paused on each slide, you'll have an opportunity to rank the topics that came out of that meeting at AGU 23. And then there'll be some free text options where you can put in comments of your own in case we've missed something. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing now, Shelly, and move to that. Great. Um, so I, it's probably worth saying to all of you brilliant people that you're gonna wanna start like solving problems and having opinions on some of these topics. Um, so if you just maybe not be too verbose, I, I'm not gonna tell you not to do that because you are who you are, um, but uh, like Mark and I just went back and forth on uh, something having to do with with data um, uh, peer review for data, but if you could all focus on more of the topic that we want to look at, um, and it may be that it's a low hanging fruit topic, it may be that it's something that we only need a short discussion on, or it may be something with a long discussion on. I think at this point, I would focus on what's most valuable to you, your community, and your network, um, and then we can further uh, filter for what's possible within Copdes um, and see how that goes. Okay, so here we are, the Mentimeter. So um, are you all in there yet? I see four of you have answered questions. There's almost 30 of you. There's over 30 of you. So let's go for a pretty high number here. So um, these are the broad topics. Uh, so it's okay to say other, that's no problem. Um, but if you could weigh in on uh, repository and infrastructure, especially sustainability and support, so funding, um, uh, you know, uh, commitment to usage, um, the next one being data citation cre uh, credit. I know credit's a, a, a difficult word because that's a construct on its own, but at least data citation and attribution um, and potentially recommendation for those who uh, weigh in on credit. Uh, article publication, publishing workflow uh, is currently running in at number three. Um, uh, it was, uh, I, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was on the survey. It might have been a little bit higher on the survey. And of course, the care principles, which we know are, um, uh, there's a lot of work going into them by the care authors right now, and they're in the indigenous community. So we should be seeing some more results. And our own uh, ESIP sustainability, a uh, repository sustainability cluster is about to do a publication on their analysis and work with the care authors on the care principle. So um, that might be a good reason for it to be a lower number here because um, they, they will have something to say there. All right, we've got 20 folks. Could a few more people perhaps weigh in? Um, maybe get up to 25 before we move on. 22, data citation overcame repository and infrastructure sustainability. That's kind of fun. Um, 23, there we go. Nothing moved. Okay, 24, still about the same. Okay, excellent. Excellent. So let's, uh, let's, ooh, ooh. Article publishing repository infrastructure statistically neck and neck. That's very good. All right, so <laughs> citations and credit and attribution. That seems to be quite powerful here. Excellent. Um, Shall I move now, on, Shelly? Yeah, let's move. Oh, we almost have 25. Way to go, guys. Um, uh, one of the, um, oh, thanks, Raina. Uh, yeah, if you want to put your other into the chat, go right ahead. If the, if the, uh, For those of you, um, oh, there's the other. Sorry, there. There we go. You should there be able to input it in the Mentimeter now, uh, I hope. Okay. So for those of you who put other or all of a sudden came up with another, um, you can pop it in now. 
All right, thumbs are up, thumbs are up, thumbs are up. We got nothing here. If you come up with it later, um, the chat is also available. Lots of thumbs coming in. Okay, that's good enough. Um, it would be nice to hear very briefly from Reina what she's talking about with the this reform of scientific publishing that she put in the chat. Okay, yeah. Um, it's just, uh, well, the International Science Council has this um, two reports out in the last year regarding um, scientific publishing, and they have a, a number of different points, but it does include um, notions of data and relationship to the journals. Um, as well as other things like the open access uh, of journals and things like that. But certainly there's a, a data component uh, that they talk about and um, that needs to be acted upon. So there's a survey out right now. Um, basically, if you read the two reports, then you can give feedback on the two reports by March 1st. Um, and then, you know, I imagine they'll lead to some other uh, output from them that shows what the community is saying. But um, I think that this this group here might have a really good voice for that topic. Oh, that could be another, you know, weighing in on things like that. Yep, that could be something that could come as a cop desk thing or individually or from your own organizations. Thank you, Raina. Thanks. All right, we have five answers here. So if you, if even if you did not rank article publication workflow as your highest priority, um, with this topic in mind, if you could then rank the subtopics. So here we have um, coordinating publisher workflow between repositories and publishers. This is, um, uh, uh, we're going to be getting uh, an update from Natalie on this work after we have this Mentimeter output. Natalie's working with Danny Kincaid um, to get this working group stood up in RDA. Um, uh, and then secondly here at the moment, we've got author guidelines in education, editor guidelines in education. Yes, they are different, right? Uh, data repository sele selection guidance. Um, this has been a challenge. Um, and, you know, no matter where it ranks, it's still going to be something we need to address um, or hope somebody addresses. Peer review issues just swapped with DOIs for data. It, um, keeps, <laughs> it keeps swapping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it does. And we, we could use maybe like 10 or more folks to weigh in right now. There's 17 of you. Um, so if 10 or more folks, um, if you're, if, uh, if you need to get to this Mentimeter, if you've just come in, I see maybe we got one new person, um, the numbers there for menti.com, or you can use the QR code, um, Selection guidance. So author guidance is leading, which is exciting. And the an opportunity here is uh, we do have guidance that many publishers use that AGU put together during the, um, primarily this was during the end of uh, Enabling Fair Data Project with COPDES. Um, and so we've actually uh, talked about this being an active action this year to update AG's author guidelines. So maybe this could be something Coptus could help with um, on number one. Uh, a lot of our society friends. Right. Oh, and 23. And if maybe a couple more, or maybe that's taking too long. Okay, 24 and we're going. Come on, 24. All right, let's go ahead to the next one. So author guidelines is winning. Oh, a couple questions. Oh, shoot, sorry, Megan. Um, let me go look at the uh, chat. Sorry, I wasn't watching that. Um, oh, okay, Raina's point. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right, Megan. So who else is working on it? Um, so yeah, before we, we if, it, if it does make sense for Coptus to take a look at, we really should see what the, um, what the landscape is and uh, maybe just ask for updates. You know, maybe this isn't something we work on actively. We just keep track of it and support in some way. Um, yeah. 
Yep, that's good. That's good. I like it. Thanks, Megan. All right, we're on to um, the the winner on the first slide, the data citation credit and attribution. So everybody jump in here. Um, by far, this is the one you really love the most. Um, so issues, citation issues with publishers, boy, do I have opinions on that. Um, solutions for finding citations to give DOI, to give it to a given DOI. Um, how to make researchers and repositories value data DOIs. Um, that's interesting. Um, and then tracking progress on data citation efforts. Um, and we will hear, um, uh, Christine, are you sharing, are you sharing the data citation work? I, I can't remember I, a little bit on this session. Um, or... I had a poster to talk a little bit about our, um, data citation work at AGU. And, uh, I think that might be of interest to people in this area, but I'm not talking about it during this session now. Yeah. So definitely catch, uh, Christina's po uh, poster. And um, if it's if it's the most important thing for you, then please do just get in touch with her. She'll be happy to walk you through it. It's fascinating and there's a lot more work to do. Um, all right, 23. Already at 23. Wow, excellent. Thanks everybody. Publishers won. Publishers won. All right, uh, maybe somebody could put the nature paper in to show everybody <laughs> what we know so far. Um, okay, uh, then. We're on to repository and infrastructure sustainability and support. That should be near and dear to all of your hearts. Um, I have a funny feeling that uh, things having to do with Monday money are gonna are gonna do well here. Um, but no one's touching this. Come on, hop in, folks. They're all important problems. It's hard to prioritize. <laughs> <laughs> Good to hear your voice, Bruce. Oh, excellent. Here we go. Some somebody hit enter. Excellent. Oh, you were thinking about it. That's what you were doing. You were reading and, and looking at it carefully. Now I see. This is near and dear to your heart. Sustainable funding support for data curation incentivizing use of repositories, offering curation. By the way, I think that is like so important, but um, funder repository coordination for repository selection, absolutely. Uh, coordination of repository selection guidance, yes, yes, yes. Uh, solutions for verification of trusted repositories, yes. And we there's a lot of work in Core Trust Seal, the World Data System, that's a lot going on there. Uh, data user outreach and education. Yeah, um, uh, Christina notes that we are looking at this with the optics of what what should Coptus go after, um, but we can all when we when we interrogate these answers, we can double check and make sure it's a good fit, um, and that there isn't other work or um, that we should just uh, identify um, and support others. Okay, so we're at twenty four. That's pretty good. Sustainable funding, winner winner, chicken dinner. All right. Uh, other issues for Coptus, what have we missed? I think this is free text. Oh, understanding the subcategories. I'll, I'll tell you what, they're, they're as defined as well as they were on the post-it notes on the wall at AG23. So there's room for clarification. There's room for fine tuning. There's room, we can do lumping and splitting. Um, I had to explain that today in the meeting. I'm in at Leiden, what lumping and splitting is. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't have to be super hard fast. If you thought something was bent one way, um, we can always bend it that way. Oh, uh, so so the, the outcome from the mentee will be combined with what we have in the surveys, and then we'll actually meet and have conversations on this outcome. So these are not decisions being made, they're just data being gathered, um, a way for the community to say at large, um, this is what's most important in general ways. And then we can define um, exactly what makes sense. So, so yes, I think, I think we're, I think there's like a good salt shaker amount of salt going into this, maybe bigger. Yeah. How do we get moving faster? Thank you for that. Um, how do we, how do we make, how, support this group and, and have it be, um, 
um, uh, effective and efficient. Uh, incentivizing, incentivizing publishers to facilitate data publication prior to manuscript re manuscript review. Um, I, I I would probably do a little bit of fine tuning on that, but yeah, the gist makes sense to me. Um, absolutely. Uh, you don't have to talk AGU into that. We're there, and we're uh, we've got a, a whole program walking through all of our journals. Um, but and we are more than happy to share that as a you know an offering. Um, if a if an agency publishes a technical report, AGU journals will not publish that same report because it's already published. This conflicts with other best practices for PAR and causes ethical issues. Um, if it's a if it's a preprint, we we um we we allow that to be slighted and we allow publication on top of the preprint. So maybe you can give us an example of that. We can make sure. Um, uh, everyone uh, understands what that means. I don't think anybody from AGU pubs is on the call to clarify. Uh, how do you decommission DOIs? Uh, supposed to be permanent, but sometimes stop resolving. Um, I think you can, there's a way to report that actually. I think you can report that and try to get that resolved. Uh, I actually did that once. Um, turned out that there was a, a big error uh, in the linkages. We found a whole group of errors in one of ours um, not AGU, but somebody else. I made some phone calls to get, figure out why there were four or fours happening. 400 pound gorilla, effective adoption strategies for outcomes. Yes, that's very nice. Um, uh, we have the tech, is it just the people? There's a lot of focus on DOIs here. Should we be supporting other PIDs as well? That's a really good point. Publishers tend to, at this point in time, focus on DOIs. But I don't think that makes sense. I think we actually need to push the agenda of the other relevant persistent identifiers. Um, and there's some work happening there. And, and maybe that's a position statement coming from Coptus. Like, listen, people, we could really use this. Um, pushing back on the big publishing companies, other scholarly communication entities to ensure they meet our needs rather than us bending to their will. Yeah, probably more of a problem within commercial because um, societies will have publication committees put together of their membership. Um, so that's what that's how AGU functions. We our members guide our publication. So um, I'm, you know may, you, that may or may not have been part of the thinking there, but yeah, that more commercial publisher uh, element there. Uh, might be beyond the scope, but strengthening emphasis on making data accessible to the places people it comes from. Um, that, I really like that. That goes to democratization. It goes to um, equitable equitable access and um, rights owners, really. It, it, hits, it hits into some of the elements in, that CARE looks at as well. Um, thank you. That's a good one. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, Looks like we're slowing down a little bit. Might be a good time to go on to our next topic. Thanks everybody, that was fantastic. So thanks Shelly. Um, and I just wanna let everyone know that uh, if you're on the COPSES um, email serve, listserv, uh, we've also been sharing the survey as well as the full text of the attendee responses there, which you're welcome to comment on. Welcome to send us a message or leave notes in the session notes. Um, this is really just a, a way for us to source some of the topics that are uh, at the top of people's minds and that might be suited for COPTES. No decision making, like Shelley said. Uh, so uh, I think next up we're going to briefly hear uh, from Natalie Rea about the um, work that she and Danny Kincaid are doing on one of the topics that surfaced uh, from these attendee responses. Um, Natalie, I'm going to share my. Uh, screen again so you can go through your slides and then we'll have open discussion. Perfect. Um, so I'm a bit of a stand in for Danny Kincaid today. My name is Natalie Ray. I'm at University of Arizona. Um, and as has been mentioned, I just signed on as a co-chair for this new RDA uh, working group. Um, and so I have a few slides today about uh, kind of the goals and timelines for this work. Um, and and certainly it's good to be in this session and in conversation with everybody because the goals um, overlap significantly, I think, with some of the results from that Christina shared from the AGU session and what we saw with the 
Mentimeter polling uh, questions a few moments ago. Uh, the primary message to convey today is that we are moving forward with standing this up for formal RDA recognition uh, imminently, and we will begin regular meetings starting next month to make project uh, progress on this project. And so we'll have some information shortly uh, on a slide and some links in the chat about ways to get engaged and stay in the loop. Uh, next slide. Uh, so by way of introduction, I think this will be, you know, uh, context that pe some people have, but maybe new for some. Uh, this working group aims to reduce uh, friction currently <laughs> between uh, repository and publisher workflows as they pertain to and rely upon uh, the data publication process. Um, and so as, as this audience is certainly well aware, uh, publications are now requiring data cited to be stored in rec recognized repositories and linked to papers via DOIs. And so there's uh, clear challenges and gaps in awareness and communication across all stakeholders, publishers, repositories, researchers, and funders. Um, and additionally, existing domain and institutional repositories are challenged to fit into both public paper publication and workflows um, and, with, and to match with repository selection um, criteria. And so this working group really aims to address um, some of these bottlenecks and, and touch points between repository uh, journal workflows. Um, next slide. And so this was a slide that appeared in a session on Tuesday, um, but these efforts have a, a multi-year history at this point and have been uh, socialized and worked on since uh, kind of the beginning of COVID. Um, and they've particularly gained traction in the last two RDA uh, plenaries. Uh, next slide. And so um, one meeting was held in February of 2023, almost a year ago, with about four participants. Um, and a case statement was reviewed and suggestions were incorporated um, from those prior efforts from the last slide. Um, and uh, the case statement includes some specific objectives related to both repository and publisher uh, recommendations. And so now we're in a stage uh, where we're ready to launch the working group. Uh, next slide. And so this is just showing some of the specific objectives that are in the case statement. Uh, we'll circulate a link to that case statement and you're certainly welcome to um, review it and add your name. We're, we're actively you know, still looking for people to be involved with this, either at the co-chair level or, um, or just to stay involved with, with the group's uh, efforts. And next slide. And so these are the two ways that you can uh, stay involved and or stay in the loop. Uh, there is a link to the RDA Working Group page uh, where you can hit join group uh, to stay in the loop. And, and like I just mentioned, the uh, draft Google Doc case statement is also linked there. And that is all I have. Thank you. Thanks so much, Natalie. So um, I dropped the links in the chat for Natalie and Danny's working group and for the draft case doc statement. And if you want to get involved or know a publisher that should be involved, um, feel free to write them. I'm going to hand off now to Kirsten, who is going to lead us in a, in a closing discussion on the priorities for COFTAS and any other topics that you want to surface. Thank you. Yeah, again, I encourage any feedback. I mean, the, the some of the things that were put into the Mentimeter could be further elaborated on now, if you want to make a point. Um, I won't actually uh, hope you're not mad with me, Megan, but maybe your point that you just put in the chat, you could uh, bring that up. Yeah, I'm happy to share it. Uh, just just from observing other collaborations, I think it a, a goal here, and as important a goal is to kind of cultivate the relationship between all the different groups that take part in Coptis. And so what you choose to take on specifically matters a whole lot but also maybe starting with something that kind of grows the goodwill so that you want to continue to work together um, is a good place, a, a good criteria maybe as you're narrowing focus. Hope that made sense.
sometimes that's an argument for not starting with the most difficult thing, but starting with something that will give you a feeling of success and then give you the energy to move into the next, the next challenge. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, many of these these topics have actually been brought up over and over again at the Coptis meetings. And I think the the main challenge remains to actually get something done, you know, and that is the point of this RDA working group um, that you focus in on a specific challenge or a specific problem and try to solve that. Uh, but that happens outside Coptis, right? So maybe in the first place, we are achieving a, a low-hanging fruit objective to just keep the dialogue going, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the the feedback that we really need now is, you know, is is that sufficient? And we have enough other other activities going on that we can outsource, so to say, the, the problems, uh, getting that going, or or does it come, does it have to be under the you know umbrella of, of Coptis? And how I mean to me, one of the big challenges remains um actually engaging the editors and and the publishers as well but what i found really um yeah motivating was interaction uh on a domain specific level i should just briefly mention that last uh, year at our geochemistry at the annual global geochemistry conference is the Goldschmidt conference. And we had as repositories within geochemistry, we had a meeting with publishers that specifically focus on geochemical data. Uh, and the discussion, yeah, really had more tangible outcomes where editors were really able to tell us this isn't working and I don't understand this. And can you give us a list of repositories that work for our field and so on? So is, you know, that triggers to me, you know, a um, a task within Coptis to build sort of a template for domain specific interaction with between repositories uh, and, and journals that are specific engagement of uh, domain specific societies, for example, um, is is a big aspect there. Um, so are there others here who who would think that is a beneficial um, activity from their perspective? I, I would I would plus some thousand what you just said, Kirsten. Um, it, it might be helpful to know that Christina and I are working on a pilot with the hydrology community to walk through their challenges. I I will tell you that we're coming at it a little differently. We're meeting with the section leaders. Mm -hmm. and, oh, well, and I, I love that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you have access to them. So we do, we do. And that is a benefit. Um, but you know, I I would I'm absolutely open. I I, I there's no way that Christina and I have all the information necessary to do this, right? Like we, there's, we would have to do this in collaboration. Um, and I wonder if it's something that we could, um, we could do together with Coptus. We just, you know, uh, maybe reach out to the Coptus community, invite anyone connected in with hydrology data, um, even, or just wants to lurk around and participate in the interchange. Um, and help shape what that looks like. We're, we're essentially piloting. Um, the humorous thing is hydrology is our largest section. So why did we do that? Well, partly because of the work that um, Kawazi has done. Um, EDI has hydrology data. Um, EDI is, is, is a rather um, um, a, you know, robust community. Um, but there's hydrology data at, um, Bruce, you've got hydrology data, don't you? I'm pretty sure I just read that 
Ornal has a uh, or not or not. Yeah. Hydrology is, in my opinion, one of the areas where the um, DAX are most fragmented. Hydrology data, by depending on how you look at it, is it at least six different DAX? Oh snap! Yeah. Well, that's oh oh fun times. <clears throat> and I could oh. probably give a broader definition of hydrology and include even more than that. Yeah. I mean, what we could what we could do is maybe at our um, oh, Kirsten, you didn't tell them about our first meeting. We have we have the monthly meeting set up. Oh yeah! Oh my goodness! Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. I mean, I have, what what I mentioned was the look back that we haven't had enough regular meetings, and so we're actually starting to have monthly meetings and. Um, yeah, what is it? February 7, right? Yep, yep. Megan yeah. just put it in. It's on the ESIP calendar um, and it's at 5 p.m. And that's to accommodate as many time zones as possible without being too late for Helen Glaives. So, you're <laughs> pretty late for her. Well, it's 11 p.m. where I am and I, I'm farther east than she is. So, she has no excuse for not being here. I just, I just, just no, talk to the hand. Um, so yes, it's doable. It's doable for Europe. <laughs> they can handle it. Um, but yes, we're gonna give it a go. So yeah, we could we maybe what Christian and I could do is walk you through where we are, what we're thinking, get feedback, see what the connections that we're capable of doing. Uh, we are trying to find funding. So um, you know, you should be a partner on the funding proposal. Uh, we haven't started, we haven't started working on that yet because we're frankly here um uh, but um but we do intend to to ask for at least a little bit of money um and if we can find the right funder maybe a little a lot more because we want to do all 25 sections and our intention is to include egu and as much of um jbu j j g japanese geoscience union i'm sorry a g p u jg <laughs> um it uh they're interested but as is with their culture, they are they would want to observe first before they will jump in. Um, so that's great. I mean, the fact that they're willing to do that is a win in my book. So, um, but EG is very excited. John Sulker is the chair uh, or the president for hydrology, um, and he has been very keen on this. Um, we we've, we've been talking to them since I think November, Christina. I think we started talking to them in November. It's a slow uptake because they were busy with the December meeting. So they weren't able to do a whole lot ahead of that. Um, Jordan Reed um, for Kawazi, that he's co, um, one of the sponsors for the Water Cycon, which is in June of this year. So what we said to him is no matter what we come up with to do, uh, we would um, size it to have a co-located meeting. Um, at WaterCycon to get, I don't know, something for, something significant because of the number of people coming together. So, you know, if we're scrappy and we're able to get a review on some document, so think something small, right? Not too big, maybe even a repository list, right? Like something small, um, uh, just to start like flexing the muscle. What does it mean to work together? Um, uh, and then we we want to keep it going. Like, okay, well, you you figured this piece out. Let's figure the next piece out. Okay, let's. So what's interesting is every time we talk to the sections, <clears throat> once they figure out that this could potentially help them, and they get there themselves, they get to the data management plan themselves. They say, oh, this could help us with the data management plan. We're like, yes, yes, it can. Um, they get very excited, and then they say, oh, well, if that's the case, we'd like to talk to you about. And then they have their own list. So um, it is, we don't know that it's all going to look the same for each section because they definitely have their own culture. But um, I'm going to stop talking. I realize I'm running at the mouth here. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just looking at, at Bruce's comment in the chat, which I, you know, I'm in full agreement with, you know, we just had at the last session, we had a similar discussion about how many more efforts do we need. Uh, is 
the more we can coalesce, the the stronger efforts get to be, and you know, the less confused we are and who's doing what and so on. Um, I wonder though how that happens, right? Uh, I mean, again, it's it's just knowing about everything that's going on and what everybody is doing uh, is is one of the big challenges. And you know, with Coptis, it seemed so far, and every time we we have asked the participants or you know the broader community. It's like yes, Coptis should continue. Uh, it's it it sits in a in a niche that nobody else really covers, uh, but we we seem to still have a challenge to actually have more impact and you know do it in a. Um, yeah, more sustained and 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 um, effective way. You know, it's. I mean, we can just be happy to meet every year. You know, in December and in April, and um, lay out what everybody is is um, trying to solve, and maybe have you know sort of serendipitous uh, collaborations coming out of a meeting. Um, that alone, I think, is is something nice, but um, I think there is potential for a lot more to happen. And and just the this Mentimeter survey it shows how many problems there are and where the big, um, which are the the top priorities really. Um, can we how, or how could we actually? find out who else is doing something when we have, let's say, you know, in each one of these categories that we ask, we have the top level priority. And you all send us information, who else is working on that, who should be at the table, or who can we hand this mm -hmm. over to? I think we're, we're moving in that direction, but this is where I think it's also, who are we paying attention to? And yeah, you know, I'm going to acknowledge Megan as just one example, because I was headed off in a bit of an isolated direction. And Megan was the one that said, hey, you know, here's this other thing that's going on. Why don't you, you know, work with that? And, and you know, I think we have people doing it, but we also have to, to ask some of those those right questions. And Megan, Susan, Shelley, I mean, lots of uh, folks are sitting in intersectional places. Um, so just just a thought. I mean, I, I'm really you know, enthusiastic about the the approach and getting sections of societies uh, engaged. And I I also think it can't be just AGU because there are other societies and other sections in there if we want to have that um yeah inclusive comprehensive um approach and and you know that brings ultimately really impact um so i I'd, I'd like to actually understand a bit more of what where, where Shelley is thinking. And I don't know, are you going to talk about that on February 7, maybe? I mean, yeah, I, you know, you, you know that we haven't actually met to come up with that agenda yet. So I, you know, I offer it as a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I will admit to having tried to, you know, watching one geochemistry, which is an incredible example of um, having, you know, some decent funding to get that going. I, th I think, I mean, actually that maybe starting with like an outbrief on what that's all about, you know, what you were able to accomplish, what, you know, what you modeled there, maybe, you know, things that worked and didn't work or whatever. Um, I have, uh, I've had very tentative conversations. Um, uh, what I mean by tentative is, you know, these are, you know, you we have council dinners, so I get to meet with all the um, sections pretty regularly during the year. 
and you can have a informal, you know, sidebar next to the coffee pot and say, Hey, if I said to you, da -da 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 -da, would this be interesting to your section? And no fail every time I've done that. And I've done it maybe seven times. So I'm, I, I don't want to talk to all 25 at the same time because that would be horrible. You could never service 25 sections at the same time. It would, it would, there, it would be awful. Yeah. Um, you could just, it would look bad. And, um, but I did pick five during one conversation, one meeting, I, I talked to five and then I talked to a couple more, um, no fail every time it was yes. Yes. And I have these other concerns. Yes. And so, so, but it did take a little while for me to explain what we were interested in because, you know, we have informatics speak and they have researchers speak and we had to kind of navigate and they said, oh, you mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. You know, you just have to remember how they talk about it. Um, so once we got to, oh, you mean, it's like, oh, okay, good. And then I learned that hydrology has actually been trying to do this for a while and they didn't quite get there. Um, we, we do know the paleo folks actually wrote some documentation a little while ago. And honestly, it just needs to be updated, um, you know, just celebrating what they've already done. Um, so I, I don't want to ever walk in there assuming they've done nothing because that's probably not the case. They know where their data is. They know what their favorite repositories are. It, it's just a matter of making sure their entire community does and that there's some, you know, understanding of preference. Um, so, and I mean, that just, just reminds me and maybe Leslie can talk a little bit about this. What uh, one geochemistry in its, you know, an initial efforts towards standards in geochemistry realized how complex the, the situation is and how many different techniques and data types and so on there are. So as a first step, we started following this um, initiative in the, in the ocean sciences to just build an inventory of what all kinds of best practices are. Leslie, can you, you were more familiar with this ocean practices, ocean data practices portal. Uh, I'll jump in while Leslie is finding her mic and say that, you know, Shelly, all the conversations that we've had, uh, all the, you know, different elements that you're highlighting as, you know, researchers are thinking about this in one way, they're already starting on it. And Kirsten, your, your mention of the inventory that you started with, I think are emphasizing Megan's point in the discussion, um, you know, this mapping exercise could be the first output of COPDES, uh, bringing people together, mapping where the gaps are, um, which, you know, our survey was yep. a little bit of an attempt at doing, but in a much more detailed way. And then mapping that to who's actually showing up and willing to put effort in at that time. But even that mapping exercise will require effort and you know that's that's really been I think the the obstacle for Coptis to make a lot of progress. It it I wonder, you know, if if we can brainstorm about innovative ideas to get maybe, you know, some level of um fellows, you know, I mean. ESIP labs are one thing, you know, but having an ongoing fellowship in Coptis where certain topics can be taken up by an early career scientist or, you know, to actually drive maybe for three, four months with full focus, um, do these exercises of gathering information, of mapping, uh, you know, between communities and so on. And uh, you know, really, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how we would get that funding, but it, it wouldn't be much, and maybe some level of fundraising is, is, is actually possible. You know, we, I mean, we're dealing here actually with, with publishers in part with commercial publishers, and, you know, I've seen other efforts that focus on standards that have have lived off sponsorship from 
uh, commercial entities that were, were close to them. So, I mean, I'm not saying that's the way to go, but I think we should be open to solutions and, and brainstorm about that. Uh, but that, those may be ways to actually get something done. Because, yeah, writing a proposal for each each of these uh, uh, these topics is seems a bit uh, unrealistic and cumbersome. Just one more quick community manager thought here, like watching collaborations get started or reignited in, in the case, I think, of Coptis here. Um, you have kind of two types of people. I don't want to bin people, but I have seen collaboration areas have more or less success um, over the tension of, I just want to get something done and I want to dive in right now. And this thought of like, no, I don't know enough. I need to look around. I need to, I need to learn a lot of things before I can start doing something concrete. And some people just will not come along for that ride if they don't see themselves having some kind of success immediately, if they don't see the group as being effective immediately. So I think whatever you choose to do, you have to balance this task of like growing trust and delight in working together and getting stuff done. Um, even if, you know, Mark put it well, small things that contribute to big things, both as a means of, you know, exciting the people who are already there and attracting others to say like, oh, look, Coptus actually gets stuff done. So as you're choosing things, kind of making sure they, they meet both those criteria also is important. Thanks, Megan. I think that's great advice. Anything else, any other topic that we should touch on? Uh, are there any ideas for a priority on the February 7 meeting? Uh, I'll make an attempt at summarizing. I mean, it seems to me like there might be interest in hearing about Shelley's work, maybe as a first step towards doing mm -hmm. that mapping. And it does sound like there's, uh, I, I think your point about funding is a really pertinent one, Kirsten. Uh, so some sort of exercise in going through what's achievable with the resources we have uh, versus what do we need to immediately try to seek money before we can even start on. Um, Raina's re adding to what Christina just said, Raina is reminding me that um, WDS actually has some new initiatives that are going on that it would be nice to get. Maybe maybe we can have um, some like lightning talks um, to learn more about that. Um, Raina, I'm, I'm here with David Castle and I've been learning about stuff as, as you know. So um, uh, I'm really excited about your work. So I think I think that sort of thing and, and others also would be kind of a neat opportunity. I don't know what he's sharing with you exactly. Um, so that's kind of <laughs> nerve wracking. Um, Sorry, it seems to be all good. So don't worry. I mean, <laughs> um, I yeah, but, but, ha but happy go. to, yeah, but I mean, maybe something at that February 7th meeting, um, is an option too. Yeah. Oh, and you know, I should really tell you where I am. I don't know that it's worthy of February 7th, but I'm on um I was invited to come to the the road uh the road to fair and equitable. This is the 10 year anniversary for the fair guiding principles and the authors are mostly here and they're coming up with their roadmap for the next 10 years. Um so it's been an exhausting week because we're all working towards um presenting actually we're going to do it in a in about 12 hours um or so we're going to present to a bunch of policy folks primarily um european um there are a few u.s folks here um canada is represented nicely um and uh maybe i could give a report out on what those um uh bullet points are I, it does not have to be february 7th though this is it, it can be later or in another venue.
Okay, I just got a little reminder here from from Leslie. Um, Leslie, you wanna wanna push again? It has to do with the RDA working group. Um, yeah, I just like to say it's really sad that Danny is not here because, as um, Natalie showed in her slide, it's been going for a few years. And I'd like to also credit ESIP because this kind of started with the um, Council for Data Facilities. And then it came to ESIP and we've had a good response. We've had a good response to the working group, but um, Danny is very overloaded. And I'm just wondering whether or not, uh, what is the interest in helping get that working group going? Um, again, we did take that to um, RDA. Uh, at the moment, we're still proposing it as an earth an environmental science working group, but there has also been suggestions um, on broadening it out. Um, yeah. Natalie's, that they're just saying, oh, why are you doing this in earth sciences? This is relevant to um, other groups. Um, so I really feel, although, you know, in some of our surveys, fixing that publishing uh, repository, researcher workflow, has been brought up many times. Well, the amount of work that's already got into that. And I think did someone put the statement in the chat. I thought I saw it there. Um, that, you know, ha who's interested and um, how can we really help Danny and accelerate it? Uh, I'd be willing to try Natalie, to I yeah. Natalie, I think you and Danny are meeting pretty soon to start finalizing the, the charter. Is that right? Yeah, Danny and I are um, trying to schedule a meeting for the two of us to get coordinated, but then also to um, send out a, a larger communication. Hopefully, the it'll probably be uh, after the Coptus meeting on February 7th, but probably the next week after that. Um, yeah, well, we did actually have a group that was starting to meet, but then... Unfortunately, Danny had some commitment issues and it fizzled out. It'd just be great if we could tip that thing over the edge mm -hmm. because the working group already has a pretty good program for, you know, let's finish this, let's get this over. Now, uh, I think, Shelley, you're a better one to comment on it, that the publishers do go to um, RDA, but they don't advertise that they're there. But, um, yeah, I just think we need to... Yeah. Um, so if you and um, Natalie, if you and Daddy meet, then maybe through this Coptus cluster, could you start advertising that you're going to get the working group going? Absolutely. And, um, yeah, and I see Christina's put something uh, common to disciplines outside of ESES. Uh, I don't know whether Mark's still here, but, yeah, we've really been told, look, this is not just necessarily... ESES, and we're a little bit worried to expand it because we know our domain. Um, if I don't know whether um, Karen's still here from the and um, Nick from the CDF, um, this surely would be something that the CDF would be interested in. Renya, I don't know whether it'd be interesting to your WDS group as well. I, mean, we, I think we Karen can had to leave, but Nick, are you? Nick is still yeah, the here. CD the CDF would be happy to to have uh, somebody from that group come and talk and explain what you guys want to be doing and promote it if you like at some point. So maybe um, Natalie, when you and Danny get going again, and you know, I'm sort of being nominated as a chair on that, so I'm ha happy to help to bring in Australia. But maybe we should start advertising that working group on both the cop this cluster list and also um nick karen would you mind if we started putting it on um your your mailing list as well yeah we could do that um the cop this list will have um several publishers but I, there's also a separate publishing list that i've got um for the the whole slew of them um yeah. Um, yeah. I guess the other thing too is that, see, with the CDF, I know people say, oh, that's North American. Um, 
and it's you know limited in terms of the global picture. But I also look at your CDF list and see you've got the big repositories, you've got the small repositories, you've got different types of repositories. And if you abstract it to that more generic pattern, um, it really does give uh, lots of feedback because I certainly know that, um, well, I argue it's actually sometimes hard to move repositories because particularly the big ones is they're very processed um, operationalized and you know the you know the thing of trying to turn a battleship around going full speed of hell or you know 100 pound gorilla and the smaller ones when you suggest something they don't have the infrastructure to do it so I do see the CDF as really important in helping move some of this stuff forward Leslie, you just you just faded out a little bit, and I would I think I would add one more thing in to support um, to add to the deliverables, but it, it, some sort of a um, um, you know, a, like a little bit of guidance for authors um, that we can that's agnostic of publisher. Um, I think that would be like maybe a little video, Natalie, that you and Danny do to explain to authors what they need to be thinking about that other publishers can just link to, um, I think would be really helpful. Um, and, and Natalie, what I'm thinking about for publishers is they're not the, it's hard to get them to come to working groups just to sit and listen to conversation. You You really need to focus them on here's the thing, what do you think about this, this, and this? And then, you know, just get them to folk to, to answer right away. Um, so after you guys get, you know, your feet going again, I am happy to introduce, you know, host a, I don't know, a, a, an online town hall or something for you to, to get them to come. Um, I think it would be, you know, I, I, I mentioned these domain specific <laughs> dialogues earlier. And I think it would be good if there is sort of a, a set of recommended steps or something, a few slides that we, you know, repositories that are domain specific can take to their domain specific editors and publishers and make that, you know, a consistent message that can be, yeah. you know, and not everybody comes up with their own interpretation of what comes out of that group, but rather, you know, there is uh, there's help for those who want to interact uh, on the domain specific level to to do that in a consistent manner. I think that's what's so lovely about um, Danny because she sort of started this work because of the um, traumas she was having within her uh, the who Beko Demo repository where she was getting sick to death of researchers coming and saying, oh, and you've had this too, Kirsten, can I have a DOI for this by yesterday and please ingest your data set um, into my repository? It should only take you two seconds. Um, which again is the researchers not fully understanding what goes on if you're running a domain repository. And for those of you, I'm speaking from Australia, in Earth Sciences, I just envy you guys in the US so much because we fundamentally do not have any um, domain repositories for Earth and Environmental Science data. Um, and unfortunately, people are rushing to uh, Zenodo, Mendeley, Figshare. We do have the government repositories, but for various reasons, they do not take research data. I mean, I just want to mention many of these NSF domain repositories are open globally. I don't know if there's restrictions where you have to put it into an Australian one, but... Um... Um, have a look and see how many of these NSF repositories have Australian data. Well, I mean, it's they don't have the data, but they're happy to accept it in general. Yeah, no, no, no I'm trying to say, what yeah. I'm trying to say is um, those Australians that aren't using the generic ones are either hitting the NSF ones or Pangaea. Yeah. Okay. They're already doing it. Yeah, perfect. I think we've 
been seeing departures and we yep. only have three minutes left. So uh, thanks everybody for uh, participating and I encourage you to come to the regular monthly meetings um, and the important uh, step to know what will be discussed in the meetings, what the agendas will be is to sign up to uh, the mailing list uh, of the collaboration area and cluster so that we can get the message out and yeah, let's make some progress in the many efforts and also on kind of continuing our efforts in you know an efficient and effective way and uh, we'll see where we are at the next ESIP meeting, I guess. We can look back at sort of a half year of experiences with regular meetings and progress. Thank so, you. Yep. Yeah, enjoy the last day uh -huh. of uh, of ESIP meeting.